Hello and welcome to The Lincoln Journey. I'm your host, Grant Veter, And today I'm going to try to do this without the teleprompter. So I'll be relying on notes and hopefully this is gonna work out. We'll see. We're now on part four of The Conspirators, the story of the Lincoln assassination. We left off last time as the conspiracy to kidnap Lincoln appeared to be falling apart. Now, you remember the conspirators from Baltimore, Samuel Arnold and Michael O'Loughlin, they had visited Booth in D.C., and after talking to him, they believed that the kidnapping scheme had been abandoned, so they headed back to Baltimore. Now, O'Loughlin had tried to get the money back that Booth owed him, $500, but he wasn't able to get it from Booth. Booth had been flush with cash. Uh, he made a lot of money as an actor, but he had hardly worked after the previous season had closed in May of 1864. And he was spending pretty freely. He had a very lavish lifestyle, and now he was buying all of this equipment for his intended kidnapping plot. But after he spent up his cash reserves, he had to borrow large sums from Southern sympathizers. And Arnold, the day he got back from Washington, he was able to land a new job. His father knew the sutler at the large Union base at Fortress Monroe at the southern tip of the Virginia Peninsula. So that was 80 miles away from Petersburg, which was where most of the fighting was going on between the, the armies of Grant and Lee. And he was 200 miles away from Baltimore. So he was happy to get away from there because he was feeling very nervous about his association with Booth. So he went to Fortress Monroe on Saturday, April 1st, the day that he got back from Baltimore. Now, Sunday, April 2nd, was a very momentous day. That was the day that General Lee decided that he couldn't hold Richmond anymore. He was going to pull his troops out of the trenches at Petersburg which was the last line of defense around Richmond. So he sent a telegram to President Jefferson Davis Sunday morning, and Davis was at church at the time that he received the telegram. He opened it and it read, I think it is absolutely necessary that we should abandon our position tonight. So Davis got up right then and left church, went to his office and started preparing to get his government out of town. And by 11 o'clock that night, he boarded a train with most of his cabinet and with all of the Confederate treasury, $500,000 in gold and silver, and they left for North Carolina. <clears throat> now, you may have noticed that I have in these episodes put a lot of stock in Michael Kaufman, the author of American Brutus. He presented a lot of new ideas about um, Booth's plot. And he's convinced that by the time that Booth told Arnold and O'Loughlin that he was calling off the kidnapping plot, and maybe even when he initiated that wild goose chase on March 17th when he told everyone that Lincoln was out of play at a hospital up the road from Washington, uh, that he had already decided by this time that he wanted to kill the president instead of kidnapping him. And he also believes that Sam Arnold had intuited this by the time that he told Booth that he was out of the plot. Now, if Arnold did suspect this, he didn't let on about it when he gave his statement to the authorities directly after being arrested or in the memoir that he wrote 30 years later. But it's possible that he didn't want anyone to know that he actually knew that there was a plot to kill the president. But I. I don't have the credentials to disagree with Kaufman, but I'm not convinced that Booth had made up his mind by this point. I think it was a little later. Uh, Booth was definitely steeped in the Brutus, the tyrant killer tradition of uh, Roman history and 
Shakespeare's play, but uh, it would have been quite a leap for him to rationalize uh, that he was doing the right thing and shifting from kidnapping to murder. Booth wasn't really known as a, a ruthless person. He wasn't a ruffian. Uh, many remembered him for his good nature and his gentleness. However, I do think the fall of Richmond is a likely inflection point. This news electrified the North. It meant that the collapse of the Confederacy was imminent. The war would be over soon. Lincoln was still in Virginia visiting the army. He saw General Grant in Petersburg after Petersburg had fallen. They met on April 3rd, Monday, and then the next day, Tuesday, April 4th. He walked with his son, Tad, in the streets of Richmond. He walked from the dock to the uh, presidential executive mansion. And Davis had just left that mansion two days earlier. Now, Noah Andre Trudeau, in his book, Lincoln's Greatest Journey, writes this. The often repeated story of him sitting in Jefferson Davis's chair did not happen. Well, I've probably read more than half a dozen histories by respected authors who all say that it did happen. So you can see why I have to be so careful with these historian types. So anyway, the North is ecstatic about Richmond falling, and the Confederates, on the other hand, they and their supporters, like Booth, were dejected and almost out of hope. And from all appearances, Booth was crushed. He was at this time in Newport, Rhode Island. He was staying at a hotel there with his secret fiance, Lucy Hale. Lucy Hale was the daughter of John Parker Hale, who, by the way, was an anti-slavery U.S. Senator from New Hampshire, who didn't know that his daughter was running around with a Southern sympathizer. Anyway, they were at a hotel in Newport, Rhode Island, when they heard about the fall of Richmond. And they returned from a long walk, uh, and people observed them to be in, in dismal spirits at that time. And then they left Boston shortly after that on, on very short notice. In fact, they ordered a room service meal, but by the time the meal was brought to their door, they were gone. So Booth went from there to Boston. In Boston, he visited his brother Edwin, who was in his dressing room at the Boston Theater. He was rehearsing once again for Hamlet. And Edwin tried to get a rise out of John. Uh, he, he talked about Richmond and he said, you ought to be glad. It has been a great blessing to mankind that it has fallen. And instead of defending the Confederacy as Booth, John Booth normally would, he left without a fight. And his state of mind is further illustrated by a visit that he had with a close friend, Orlando Tompkins. He was a druggist in Boston, and Booth frequently stayed at his house. They walked to a jewelry store, and Booth gave him a ring that was inscribed JWB to OT, April 6th, 1865. Tompkins was very surprised by this, and he asked him why Booth had given him this intimate gift. And Booth said, I'll never see you again. Why would he say that? Has he decided now that he's going to kill the president? I think there's a good chance of it. Booth moved from Boston to New York, and he spent an afternoon drinking with friends, especially his fe fellow actor, Sam Chester, who was getting pretty nervous around Booth. A few hours of drinking and, and Booth was getting pretty surly. And Chester steered him out of one bar uh, due to his belligerent behavior and into another. And then when they were in that bar, Booth accused the man in the table next to them of eavesdropping. Now Booth had tried to recruit Chester for his kidnapping scheme, but Chester wasn't interested and that made Booth angry and disappointed. But now Booth was telling Chester that he had given up his plan. 
But Chester's still uneasy. He's talking to a loud drunk about abducting the president. So Chester's trying to steer the conversation in another direction. And, and Booth, at this point, slams the table. And I gave you this quote before. He says, what an excellent chance I had to kill the president if I had wished on Inauguration Day. I was on the stand as close to him nearly as I am to you. Chester's response to this is, you're crazy, John. What good would that do? And Booth told him, I could live in history. Now, by coincidence, both Booth and Lincoln returned to Washington the night of April 9th. Lincoln from the battlefront in Virginia and Booth from his visits to Newport, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Now, neither of them knew that earlier that day, 1 o'clock p.m., Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox. But Lincoln knew it was close. He was uh, in very close telegraphic contact with his commanders, receiving telegrams right up to the point where he boarded the boat to head back to D.C. on the evening of April 8th. The boat they were on was called the River Queen. It steamed up the Potomac all day on Sunday, April 9th, and Lincoln was very exuberant, and he was entertaining the party that he had with him on the boat. It was a group of about 10 people, including his wife Mary and his son Tad, and Iowa Senator James Harlan and his wife Anne and their daughter Mary, who, by the way, would one day marry the Lincoln's son, Robert. Another guest that they had with them was the French Marquis de Chambrun, who kept notes and wrote memoirs later, and he talked about that trip. He said, that whole day the conversation turned on literary subjects. Mr. Lincoln read aloud to us for several hours, and most of what he read was from Shakespeare, and he particularly focused on his favorite play, Macbeth. And he was reading from passages in that play that followed the assassination of King Duncan by Macbeth and, and Lady Macbeth. And the Marquis went on to write, Mr. Lincoln paused here while reading and began to explain to us how true a description of the murderer that one was. When the dark deed achieved, its tortured perpetrator came to envy the sleep of his victim. And he read over again the same scene. In the scene that he's referring to, Macbeth says enviously, Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. This was five days before Lincoln came to the end of his life's fitful fever. They arrived in Washington around sundown. Lincoln, the first thing he did was he went to the house of William H. Seward, his Secretary of State. Seward was the former governor of New York and U.S. Senator from New York, and he was supposed to be the Republican presidential candidate in 1860, but he was beaten at the Chicago Convention by, uh, by Lincoln. And Lincoln made him his Secretary of State, and. Seward, who thought he should be president in the first place, thought that he would be the real power of the administration. He saw himself as a kind of prime minister. And Lincoln may have had a steep learning curve, but he was able to outmaneuver Seward in the early days of his administration. He knew what was going on, and he said to one of his secretaries, John Hay, I can't let Seward take the first trick. To his credit, Lincoln grew to acknowledge Lincoln's shrewdness and his wisdom. He wrote at one point to his wife, executive skill and vigor are rare qualities. The president is the best of us, but he needs constant and assiduous cooperation. Now, Seward plays a big part in the final conspiracy plan, so I need to give you some background information right up before the assassination took place. He had been seriously injured in a 
carriage accident four days before Lincoln's visit to him. He had gotten a broken arm, his jaw was broken in two places, and so he was confined to bed in his home. And by now, Seward was Lincoln's closest advisor and his best friend in the cabinet, and he was, had been seen for years as the most powerful man in Lincoln's cabinet. Now, Lincoln, when he got to see him, he laid down on his bed and he propped his head up on his elbow and gave him a first-hand account of all the things that he had seen in Virginia and all the good news that was coming from there, even though he didn't know at this time that Lee had surrendered. After his visit with Seward, Lincoln went to the White House, and around 9 p.m., Secretary of War Edwin Stanton ran him down at the White House and delivered to him the news that had arrived by telegraph that Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox earlier that day. So Lincoln and Stanton are ecstatic, and the next morning it's in all the papers, and soon the whole city is ecstatic. But not everyone celebrated. Not all of the celebration was sincere. Lewis Weichmann and George Atzerodt joined a crowd at the War Department, and Atzerodt, whom we know was very sympathetic to the South, was cheering raucously. And this surprised Weichmann, who said, Atzerodt, you're acting crazy. And Atzerodt turned all serious and said, you will find out before long that I am not half as crazy as you imagine. So, what does Atzerodt know at this point? Does he still think a kidnapping plot is on? Or has he heard about a murder plot? Or was he just talking big like he did sometimes? Given his later behavior, it seems unlikely that he had any clue that he was going to be assigned to take a life rather than row a boat. And how much has Booth decided at this point? We just have these little clues to go by, but here's another one. Just before he got back to the Capitol, he had stopped in Philadelphia, and he talked to a friend, and he said to his friend, you will hear from me in Washington. I am going to make a big hit. On April 10th, the day after the news of the surrender was all over Washington, Booth went to a pistol gallery on Pennsylvania Avenue and shot at targets. And then he went to the Surratt boarding house on H Street, and he spoke to Lewis Weichmann again, and Weichmann was pessimistic about the Confederacy. So Booth pulled out a map, and he showed Weichmann how he thought General Joseph Johnston's army could escape from General Sherman in North Carolina, so he was still holding out hope. Well, Weichmann changed the subject, and he asked Booth, why don't you act anymore? Booth said that the only play that he was interested in now was Venice Preserved. He didn't explain that reference to Weichmann, but Venice Preserved was an 18th century play that revolves around a plot to assassinate the leaders of Venice. So we're talking a lot about Louis Weichmann here, so you're probably wondering what he did next. So I'll tell you. The next day, which was Tuesday, April 11th, Mary Surratt, the Surratt who didn't get away, asked Weichmann to drive her down to Surrattsville. She said she wanted to collect on a debt. They met John Lloyd, the Surrattsville tavern keeper, on the road there. And Surratt and Lloyd talked about a Confederate spy who had been imprisoned by the Federals. And they were just making this conversation. And then all of a sudden she asked Lloyd, are those firearms still hidden at the tavern? Lloyd said that they were, and she told him that he should get them ready. They would be called for soon. So, as we would say back in the Watergate days, what did Mrs. Surratt know, and when did she know it? Why did she know about these guns? Her son, John, the Surratt who had gotten away, had hidden them. Had she been informed about the abduction plot on March 17th? when she sobbed to Weichmann that her son had gone away? Does her interest on April 11th indicate that Booth had taken her into his confidence about the assassination plan that he almost certainly by now was devising? 
it's unlikely that she was asking about the guns on behalf of her son because John Surratt was on a courier run to Montreal and from there he had been sent to do some spying in Elmira, New York, the site of the Union's largest prisoner of war camp. Well, however much she did or didn't know, Mary Surratt's involvement with John Wilkes Booth had by now extended to the point that it would seal her doom. That's the end of part four. If you have questions or comments, you can contact me at grantveter at gmail.com. And we'll see you next time on part five of The Conspirators. Mm -hmm.